evening, Lord, that, that we would just be open to, to, to you, Lord, open to your spirit, Lord, open to receive, Lord, and to take in whatever you yes, want to, Lord. to enlighten us with, Lord. I pray that, that in this moment, Lord, we can just lift up our praises to you, God, and, and glorify your name, Lord, in your name only, Lord. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that your word goes out, Lord, and it touches hearts, Lord, and it moves forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Yeah. Very yeah. lives, Lord. You deserve it all, Lord. You've taken the cross upon yourself, Lord, and I'm most rightfully honored, Thank Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Our lives, Lord, are, are indebted over to you, Lord. We, we owe you everything, God. <clears throat> the love you have for us, Lord, the, the grace, Lord, the peace that you gave us, Lord, nothing can surpass. You're the Alpha, Lord, and you're the Omega. You're everything, God. Be with, be with us, Lord, and move with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's all greet one another. Jack, or you can watch me. <laughs> uh, so I think you'll really be blessed by, by these teachings on marriage. Just a little bit of what I saw in the uh, primo videos was pretty good. So the cost, I'm not sure yet, but it's probably going to be somewhere around $50 per couple. So it covers all the costs. We're going to get some tables and, again, like I said, catering and, and so forth and the cost for the video. So <clears throat> pray about it. I have a clipboard. Virginia and I are already on it. She doesn't know it, but she's on it. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a funny mood tonight. Does it feel like that to you guys? <laughs> Not really. <clears throat> All right. Um, meeting this coming 
Sunday for all of us that are in ministry, helping in ministry, or a part of ministry. We'll begin at 12 p.m. sharp here at the church. Or if you're interested in ministry, join us. This will be a, a um, co-group with the discipleship class and also with the, the ministry um, helps. And we'll start at 12, I said, this coming uh, Sunday. Uh, FYI, Super Bowl. Virginia and I are going to host a Super Bowl at our house. So I believe it starts at 3.30 p.m. So anytime before that, you're welcome to come. Virginia's going to make a flyer, let you know what to bring. We'll just do a, a pot blessing. Uh, that used to, you know, it used to be, uh, what did they call it before? Potluck. And we didn't like the word luck. This was back in the 90s. And as Christians, you know, we don't believe in luck. We don't, we don't call it potluck. So we call it pot blessing. But today with the marijuana things, it sounds funny. Pot blessing. You know, I, I just thought of that the other day. I don't know if that sounds right anymore. So so we're just gonna we're just gonna bring food and be blessed by it as everyone brings it. Uh, and it'll be again at our house, so uh, you'll you'll see the flyer. The proximity uh, conference is February tenth. From 8.30 to 4.30, if you'd like to join us, or you're more than welcome, let me know if you'd like to go. All right, if I can have the ushers come forward. I still don't know about the trailers. They were supposed to have the parts here today or tomorrow, so we'll hopefully be here tomorrow, and then I will uh, text the guys on the, on the text and, and let you know. We probably need about, if we can get 10 guys here, that would be wonderful to get all the ramps just kind of set up. And if the guy is here to set it up, then great. He'll be able to set it up. If not, at least we have it all out. So I'll let you know when we get the parts. And, and then uh, we can meet hopefully early on Saturday. And I would really appreciate it if you could all come out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come before you now, Lord. And Father, I, I recognize as a pastor, Father, and studying your scriptures for 30 years now, Lord, that humanly it is impossible to really receive from the Lord unless the Holy Spirit has illuminated that yes, truth to you, Lord. Lord, there is no way that I can convince anybody of any truth. I can't convince even Christians uh, to, or motivate them to even get involved or to be obedient to the Word. That has to be a work of the Holy Spirit, Lord. And I understand that, Lord. But I teach it, Lord, because you command me to, as a pastor, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And if those who are willing and hear what the Spirit is saying, they will come alongside this ministry and myself, and they will help me, Lord, to broaden the borders of this work that you have here, Lord. And so, Lord, I pray for the Holy Spirit's anointing tonight to just fall upon us, and, Lord, that we would have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And like Paul said in Philippians, that if we dwell upon these earthly things and we're not focused on those things which are good, those things which are desirable, those things that are hopeful, we're going to miss it, Lord. And so, Lord, as your children, help us to hear what the Spirit is saying tonight, Lord. Would you bless the tithe and offerings? Lord, would you put it on their hearts? Lord, to give from their hearts to you, Lord, because they love you and they appreciate all that you've done for them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> okay, you can open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 23. We continue on with circumstantial laws, part three. And then we will see next week God moving the children of Israel. He's preparing them to go to the promised land at this point. He just gave the Ten Commandments, and now he's giving illustrations to Moses to give to the people and how these commandments all work. He's creating a civil court in a sense so that when the people <coughs> leave some of these struggles, they come to Moses and the elders, and then the elders and Moses will deal with every situation differently and through prayer and seeking God and what God has established as he's 
as he has told Moses what, what to do in each situation, and Moses has written them down, and then he's going to give it to the people, and it's up to the people to be obedient uh, to God as Moses is directing them. Civil laws are important. I don't know if you believe that or not, but I believe civil laws are important. And to have anarchy is to have chaos and destruction, death and um, no life at all around us if there is no civil laws. And so it's important that we have civil laws and it's important that we follow civil laws. And as Christians, we should follow civil laws. And I say this not because you don't know this, but I think as American citizens, we know that it's important that we follow the law of the land. And then since, since we live in a godless country that seems to be increasing with leaders who are seeking to redefine morality in our laws, I don't know if you know this, but I heard a study on how our law today is changing from its biblical foundation. Because of evolution and evolution coming in through Darwin, our law is modeling after the Darwin theory, is that we are evolving constantly, and so our laws must evolve as the culture evolves. And that's why you see all these laws coming into play, uh, same-sex marriage and things like this, because the culture is changing, so thus the laws must change. But God's laws are constant. They do change. They never will change, and they haven't changed in over 2,000 years. Since Christ and even before that, 7,000 years coming up. So we have a challenge in our hands as believers in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the thing that we need to understand. That we have been called to go above and beyond what the normal person is called to do. We are believers in Christ Jesus and we are to set that example for everyone else around us. You ever wonder why God called Israel? Israel really is an insignificant part of God's plan. You had all these other nations and he called Israel. Why Israel? In Deuteronomy 7.7 7, it talks about Israel being small and tiny. And God called them and he chose them because he wanted to show himself through them. So God chooses the weak things of this world so that he can work through those things, and when people see those things being worked through that person, that church, that situation, and that Christian's life, they'll go, that's got to be God. That can't be that person. And the glory goes to God. And so we have a responsibility as American citizens, but also as Christians, Romans chapter 13, to follow the laws of the land. Well, how far does that go? You know, in California, it seems like criminals are getting away with things now. I just heard someone telling me that, okay, this is hearsay. I'm not going to say it's factual, but this is coming from someone that knows a police officer. And this police officer said that, that when they go to a house that's been robbed and say they catch the thief, there he hasn't stolen anything, but they caught him, that they would literally put him in the car and then drive away as they're going to do something and then drop him off somewhere else and says, just get out of here. Don't do that again. And this is what's possibly happening in our country today. We know that's what's happening in our laws. They're letting prisoners out early, so you know why not that too? I can see that definitely happening. But like I said, it's hearsay. I'm just repeating what someone told me that an officer said. But we're living in a time and age where criminals have more rights than the citizens. And what do we do in those cases? You know, how do we follow the, the laws of the land? Should we even follow the laws of the land as Christians? And the answer to that is yes. We definitely should follow the laws of the land. Now, if those laws contradict our biblical faith, then no, we are not to follow the laws of the land, like abortion. They cannot force you to have an abortion. It, it, first, it's unconstitutional. Second, it's morally wrong, and God would not want you to have one, and you shouldn't have one. And so when there's a situation where it, when, it, when it contradicts the word of God, then we should not keep that law. So let's continue on in Exodus as we look at these various laws in respect to um, God and Moses as they're discussing various laws on, on kindness, uh, how we treat one another, righteousness, the laws of Sabbath, feast, uh, all these things that the children of Israel are going to be dealing with. So let's look at verses 1 and 3 as um, he's going to talk about respect, respecting the law. You shall not 
circulate a false report. Do not put your hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. You shall not follow a crowd to do evil, nor shall you testify in a dispute so as to turn aside after many to pervert justice. You shall not show partiality or favoritism to a poor man in his dispute. If you are called to be a witness, you are to tell the truth. You're not to create a false report, but you are to share just the truth as you have seen it or know it. Even if a group of people are giving false reports and you know something to be true, you are to stand before God and give that report. Several months ago, I was in Vons in Eastvale. I was on the other side. And um, I was walking down through the cashiers, and this lady was in front of me with a friend, and she slipped and fell. Just right in front of me, and I saw the whole thing. <clears throat> I ran over there to see if she was okay. She hit her knee, and uh, we picked her up, and she said she was fine and hurt a little bit. And I saw a little white sheet of, uh, of felt paper. I thought it was one of those... Uh, drier papers, you know, you throw in there, but it turned out that um, they give you these wipes for the carts so that you can wipe them down, you know, and you'll get the germs, and then someone threw it on the ground. So she slipped on that without seeing it. So I kicked it over to the side, it stuck it underneath the, the counter there so no one else could slip. And so afterwards, <clears throat> as I was checking out, one of the store managers came to me and said, I heard you saw the whole thing. And I said, yeah, I saw the whole thing. And I shared with them what I saw. And so I thought nothing would happen. You know, they would just take care of her and it was over. But apparently she's suing. And I got a call from a lawyer. And so then the lawyer wants to ask me some questions. And so I shared with him exactly what happened. I didn't lie. I didn't play favoritism. Here, here's a Hispanic lady, you know. Uh, we can now stick it to the system. And she can, you know, make a lot of money, you know. And maybe I can get some too. Because I did get a call from her and... And she was thanking me for, for standing up and sharing the truth. And, and that she wants to uh, uh, let me know that if something happens, that she's willing to donate to the church. You know, so she's trying to coerce me a little bit, you know, to play towards her side. But that's how I felt anyway. But I just shared the truth with, with the um, lawyer. And he said, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, we obviously know she fell. That, that's, that's clear. What we don't know is her injuries and whether it's that bad as she claims. And I said, and I'm not a doctor and I can't tell you about that. I can only tell you what I saw and that is it. You know, so we're not to create false reports and because someone is poor, we're to help them out. You know? And because they're the same you know, ethnic background, you know, I gotta take care of them. No, we're to share the truth because we are Christians. Ethnic background has nothing to do with it. And if you haven't understood that yet as Christians, we have no ethnic background. We are believers in Christ Amen. Jesus. That's it. If, if you're playing favoritism to Hispanic or to white or to whatever other colors that you might want to uh, mention, you're in error. That's unbiblical. We are Christians first. So understand that. If you ever serve on a jury, you will find that lawyers can actually call what they call expert witnesses. They will actually pay someone to come sit in the chair and give their expert opinion on the situation. I, I love jury duty. And when I worked for Southern California Edison, uh, they paid me to go on jury duty. So I always got in the case. I, I kind of know the system now. So if they didn't choose me in that case, you know, that panel, then I would go down to the front desk and say, hey, you want to put me on another panel? And they would. And I would just keep going to panels until they finally picked me on the case. And so I was always on a case. And I love jury duty. You learn so much. Uh, they had expert witnesses about uh, infantry motion and how motion works and so forth. Remember, I was in another case, DNA, and how that all works. And they showed the charts and the videos, all of that stuff. Unbiblical. Unbiblical. What God is saying here, you can't hire an a, uh, expert witness to, to um, sit there and tell you what he thinks. You just have to tell the truth and take the truth, compare them, and then make your decisions there. No partiality. Verse 4, there's a law uh, promoting here kindness and righteousness in the civil uh, conduct. If you meet your enemies, 
ox or his donkey going astray, you shall surely bring it back to him again. So, <laughs> so you have an enemy, a neighbor, somebody that you don't like, you don't get along with them. And their ox seems to wander off. You don't go, oh, there goes the neighbor's ox. <laughs> you know, you don't laugh and go, oh, can't wait till he gets home and wonders where his ox is at. You know, no, you're supposed to go over there, get the ox, and you're to bring it back to his house and make sure it gets locked up. That is the Christian thing to do. That's what Jesus would do. Jesus even summed it up in that second commandment in Luke 10, 27. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So verse 5 says, if you see the donkey of one who hates you lying under its burden and you would refrain from helping it, you shall surely help him with it. So now if the animal is sick or, or somehow lame, you're not to just look at it and say, oh, well, let someone else help. No, you are to go over there and help with that situation. Now, I think that when you do help in these situations and you have an enemy, sometimes God can break down walls and you can create friends that way then you have an opportunity to share the gospel with them. I, I know story after story of people who have come to me or, or shared, and I've heard them say how they didn't feel like they clicked with somebody or somebody rubbed them the wrong way, and there's just something I just don't like about them. And then when they really sit down and just speak with them, start fellowshipping with them, go and do something with them, they realize they're not that bad after all. You know, and the walls break down, and now they've created a relationship. And that's how it's supposed to work. We're not to have enemies. We're to try to work those things out. <clears throat> Matthew 5, uh, 43 says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of of your Father in heaven. This is what sons do, their Father in heaven. We are to treat our enemies as though they are our brothers. And not in the uh, Godfather way, you know. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. You know, type of thing, you know. So you know what they're doing and you can whack them. No, that's not what we're supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to try to reach their hearts with the gospel message. Does that mean every one of them is going to receive the gospel? Of course not. Are they going to receive you? Of course not. That's why they're your enemy. So chances are, and I, it's rare to see it happen, but you never know. You, you know, you rise to the occasion. You be the better person, and you treat them with, with kindness. Verse 6, you should not pervert the judgment of your poor in his dispute. I, I like the, the New Living Translation. It, it's a translation. It's not an interpretation. So uh, understand that. It's not taking it from the original. It's this man's opinion. But he's saying, he says the translation would be better read this way. In a lawsuit, you must not deny justice to the poor. So a rich man can take advantage of the poor because they have the resources. And we hear about it all the time. You know, they got millions and millions of dollars. And so then they throw a lawsuit on some, you know, poor guy that's got a house and barely making it. And he takes his house and everything. <clears throat> we need to be careful not to do that. Keep yourself far from a false matter, verse 7. Do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not justify the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Now these laws seem to be directed towards those judges, right? In that sense, you don't take a bribe and then give the judgment to the person that gave you uh, the money and so forth. Um, when you get into an office like that, a political office, whether it's city council members, whether it's mayor, whether it's you know senators, there's going to be a lot of bribes that are going to be coming your way. And I'm not talking about bribes in the sense that um, you know something illegal is happening, but I'm talking about bribes and, and, and contractors wanting to come and build in your place, you know, there's some kickbacks, you know, let me take you to lunch. When I was working for Southern California Edison, and some of these guys would have clients, so they'd always take them out to lunch. And back in the early or late 80s, uh, you might remember this, some of you, you could actually drink at lunchtime and get plastered and go back to work. <laughs> and they used to take them out to lunch and plaster them and then sign them the dotted line right here. 
you know, because they were trying to get something. And so, not necessarily just bribes to get your way, but, you know, if you're, you've got a business and you want your way, then you bribe them. Stuff, that's stuff we shouldn't be doing as believers in our own businesses. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the discerning and perverts the words of the righteous. Also, you shall not uh, oppress a stranger, for you know the heart of a stranger, because you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And so he's reminding them, you came out of Egypt, you were strangers there, and look at how they treated you. Don't treat them that way either. You know, people will respond to life situations in two ways. There's only two ways. If your father is an alcoholic, chances are you will grow up to be an alcoholic, or you will grow up to hate alcohol. If your father was abusive, <clears throat> you will grow up to be abusive, or you will not be abusive. If you were a stranger, you'll realize that as I was a stranger, I don't want someone to feel like a stranger, so I welcome strangers in. Because I understand what it's like to be out there, you know, out of food, out of clothing, you know, not having resources, and so I want to help out as much as possible. Or you will oppress the stranger because you were oppressed, and now it's their turn to be oppressed. I, as, again, working for Edison, I was a steward, <clears throat> and um, I had a situation where a supervisor was mistreating an employee. And so I pulled the supervisor aside so that we wouldn't go any further, and I said, you need to just stop. You know, let's, let, we're not going to file a grievance. Just, just stop doing it. Well, why would you even you know, do something like that? And his answer was this. They did it to me, when I was a meter reader, and so it's my turn to do it to them. So that's in spite, right? That's having a wicked heart and, and not seeing it the other way. We here at Calvary Care, we like our neighbors, and we want to feed our neighbors, whether they're strangers or not. It's not our food. It's not our material things. It's God's. Amen. We are just the stewards of it, and we're to just give it out to whoever comes. Yes, we have to monitor and make sure people aren't greedy, and taking more than what they need, kind of like the manna in the wilderness. And God says, just take enough for the day. Don't worry, I'll supply the next day. No, but we think we need to take it all today because we won't get it the next day. But we need to give it out to whoever has need, stranger or not. That's biblical. <clears throat> now, doing these things, and let me just make this clear, doing these things doesn't save you, by the way. And you all know that because you've been taught that here in the church. Being these type of people don't save you. Being these people is just a reflection of your salvation. That because you're saved, you are this type of person. So I just wanted to make that clear. Now the laws of the Sabbath, verse 10 through 13. Six years you shall sow your land and gather in its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat. And, they, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. In like manner you shall do with your vineyards and your olive groves. Six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall rest, that your ox and your donkeys may rest, and the sons of your female servants and the strangers may be refreshed. And in all that I have said to you, be circumspect and make no mention of the name of other gods, nor let it be heard from your youth. This is an interesting group of verses here. Because God is, is saying, look, you need to let the land rest. You need to let your animals rest. You need to rest. And when you're resting, don't get involved with other gods. Basically what he's saying here. He's saying that the Sabbath is important for the land to heal itself. Use it for seven years and then let it rest for a year. You know, when we bought this house, we wanted to have a garden, and so we planted corn, we planted broccoli, we planted all kinds of stuff, and, and then in my head, I don't think I told Virginia this, but on the seventh year, I wanted to let it rest like it said biblically. Unfortunately, it's been resting ever since. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for it. God wants the land to rest. Why? So it will produce more for you later on. It will take care of the poor and the needy. 
He wants your animals to rest. Why? So you don't run them into the ground. They need to have time to recuperate. Their muscles get sore. They get strained. They get ripped. And they need to recuperate. That's the humane thing to do. He wants you to rest. See, the Sabbath was not made to control us. The Sabbath was made for us to enjoy that day of rest. We've been talking a lot about the Sabbath lately, for whatever reason. God is just trying to get people to understand it's important to go to church. Not because they have to, but because they want to go and rest. So they're not worshiping idols, but they're worshiping God. They're worshiping God and putting God first. The Sabbath was made for them to rest. God wants you to rest. Work six days as much as you want. But on the seventh day, rest. Now, I get it, and, I, and I've shared this before, you know, but my boss says that I need to work on that day. Well, tell your boss that you don't have to work that day, that there are religious days that you have off. Amen. According to the law, you can have it off, but then they'll fire me. Well, then is it worth it to work there? Well, you're not the one feeding my kids. <laughs> no, I'm not. But I'm just asking you, when do you draw the line? When do you stand up for what you believe? That's what I'm saying. At what point? At what point? <clears throat> Again, when I worked for Southern California Edison, there was a guy there that was seven-day Adventist. Saturdays is their Sabbath day. He never worked a Saturday. And there were Saturdays every Sunday. And they, they got upset and said, you need to at least work once in a while. He goes, all right, maybe once in a while I'll come in, but I'm not coming. And he never did in all the years that I was there, 23 years. Now, maybe the union had some power, and he was able to do that. Maybe others are not, especially in California, when they can fire you for whatever reason. I understand that. But at what point do we stand up? I'm not making that decision for you. That's up to you and the Holy Spirit. But I'm just saying God has commanded us to take a day of rest. Spend some time with God in your church, in fellowship, with your family, and let your body rest, and then hit it again on Monday, all the way through Saturday. It was made for you to enjoy. It's not something that we're to put as a burden over someone. <clears throat> and if you're taking it that way, then you don't understand what it's for. If you, if you take this message as a condemnation against you, then you're not understanding what I'm saying. Because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that God wants you to rest. And if you don't rest, what happens? Break down. <laughs> break down. You eventually will break down. You'll make a mistake and they'll fire you anyway. Amen. Because you're so tired, you're so wasted, you know, and, and something will happen. And I sometimes believe God allows that too. Three national feasts. Uh, we'll talk more about this in Leviticus uh, as he will give us more details there. But they are to celebrate these three national feasts. Verse 14, three times you shall keep a feast to me in the year. So God commands that three, year, three times a year, all men in Israel had to come together to keep the most important feast, and one of them is, is Passover. Um, <clears throat> we see this in the New Testament. Millions coming to uh, Jerusalem to keep the Passover during the time of Christ. You had a great influx of men, including their families at times, that came in there to offer up their yearly sacrifice. It was commanded by God, and they kept that commandment. So not only Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and the ingathering. He says in verse 15, you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt, none shall appear before me empty. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a feast that is generally mistaken for Passover because it happens at the same time. Remember, Passover is a one-day thing. But I do believe that God is including it here. Take that 24 hours Passover and then take the Feast of Unleavened Bread because we left Israel in haste. You grab the dough and you're ready to put the yeast in it. God says, don't even do that. Let's just go. So it's unleavened, and they did that for a whole seven days to be reminded how they left Egypt in haste and how God delivered them. There was a purpose behind that. And the feast of harvest, the first fruit of your labors, which you have sown in the field. The first fruit 
is all about bringing the very best of the harvest of the field to God as an offering. God told the Israelites to give or dedicate to him the first of everything. And you'll read it in Exodus and as you get into Leviticus. Everything that was first was dedicated to God. Crops, animal, money, even children. This was their first priest. They're the ones that offer up the sacrifice before they had the Levitical tribe. So the firstborn son you were to give to the Lord. So Moses took them and used them for the work of the ministry. How would you like that? I just thought of something. Sometimes we're thrown into, children are thrown into, into these things. You know, my, when I got saved, it was such a radical spirit, salvation. It was, it was a Holy Spirit experience. It was powerful. I mean, I literally changed overnight. I remember one time Virginia looked at me and said, who are you? you you're not even the man I married. It was so different. You know, my family got thrown into that. They got thrown into the ministry, whether they liked it or not. It, it wasn't their choice. Maybe it was God's choice. I don't know. I'll have to ask when I get there. But just thinking about this right now, how would you feel? You know, you're, all of a sudden you're the firstborn son. You know, and as that son's growing up, you're telling him, you're not mine. <laughs> you're going to be given away. You're not going to be here long. God's going to take you. He's going to use you. I'm like, what are you talking about? But it's, it's the law. I have to give you to the Lord. And then when that age comes and you're like, Mom, Dad, I don't want to go. So I'm sorry. we got to go. And now they're forced to serve the Lord. Mm. Maybe it was a good thing they were trained in the beginning, you know, and it was something to look forward to. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I just wonder sometimes, you know, you have those problems with what they call uh, PK kids, right? Pastor's kids. And how they struggle <laughs> to find their own identity and, and so forth. And I just wonder <clears throat> about my family being thrown into something like that uh, without really having a choice. Of course, they have a choice now because they're adults and they have to stand by those choices. So God told them over and over and over again, the first that opens a womb or the first grain harvest belongs to me. The first always belongs to God. I don't think that has changed, and it, it hasn't changed. Even Paul in Corinthians chapter 9 says, on the first day of the week, you give, you give it unto the Lord. Um, we are to give that first of everything that we have. And by the way, um, it's what God allows us to use. So if you are using $100 a week, then $10 of that goes to the Lord. If you are using $1,000 a week, then $100 of that goes to the Lord. That's 10%. If you get a bonus and you're using whatever that bonus is, 10% of that goes to the Lord. If all of a sudden you have a family member who passes away and he leaves you a million dollars, 10% of that goes to the Lord because you get to use that. Or if you have a house and you refinance and now you take out $100,000 because you want to do a lot of work around there, 10% of that goes to the Lord. This is all coming into your home as first, and you are to give it unto the Lord. The Feast of Ingathering now, at the end of the year, when you have gathered in the fruit of your labor from the field. Now, the seventh and final feast of Israel was called the Shabbat. It was the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Ingathering. And it was a reminder of how they lived in these little huts. And so today, some... We'll build little huts to be reminded how they were in the wilderness and wandered for quite a few years. As a reminder, again, they are to keep these feasts 17, three times a year, all the males shall appear before the Lord. Now, laws regarding sacrifice and first fruits. Again, so you've set aside the first males and they're given to the Lord. Now let's Let's tell them how to offer up sacrifices. Verse 18, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor shall, you, shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until morning. The first of the first fruits of your land shall, you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. So since leaven was symbolic of sin and corruption, you're not to mix the anointing blood with the leaven and get it contaminated. 
And so it's, it's pointing towards a picture that Jesus was perfect. And his blood cleanses sin, not mixes with sin, by the way. And we are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are no longer to sin because he has cleansed us from sin itself. If atonement was to be regarded as a complete work, we must be wholly offered unto the Lord. Everything must be given to God, not a portion reserved for later. This especially includes the fat of the sacrifice, which was the greatest portion of the animal. And it was like a sweet-smelling aroma unto the Lord. Don't defile that. This was also true of the first fruits. The tenth of everything we use belongs to the Lord. Then he goes on to verse 20, 21. Talks about an angel who has the name of God. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. So this angel sent with a capital. Who is this angel? We don't know. It doesn't tell us. <clears throat> but he is to keep them in their way, keep them focused on the plan of God. He's to bring them through fulfillment of that plan. And then he goes on and says, Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. So they are to be where, that's a warning right there. Don't be rebellious against this angel. Obey his voice. Don't provoke him. What he says, do. Otherwise, we'll be in big trouble. <clears throat> what happened to the children of Israel when they came to the promised land? Joshua and Caleb and a few other men went into the land, right? And they scoped it out and they found grapes that were huge, fruits, and the men were huge. And they came back and Moses said, so what would you find? The guy says, I don't know, everything's huge over there. <laughs> Even the guys are huge. I don't think we can take it. And Joshua and Caleb are like, well, we got these guys. God's on our side. We can take anybody. They were ready to go for it. But what kept them from going in? The other men who doubted. They needed their help. Joshua and Caleb and Moses couldn't do it. God needed the whole children of Israel to go in there. How important to understand to be obedient to the angel of the Lord. God says, I've given it already to you. They should have went in then, but they didn't. And I was thinking about this scripture personally. I shared with you on Sunday how I like to take the scripture personally. How does it relate to me? When I think about this ministry, how many times God wanted to take us into the promised land. But the people wouldn't. They wouldn't. They wouldn't join in. They wouldn't help. They got upset. They didn't like had a guy here that accused me of embezzlement. Took half the people because he didn't know how to read a report. Another guy who just wanted to do his own thing. Never communicated with me, just doing his own thing. And then finally he says, I mean, I, I don't know where you're at. I have no idea. You know, he says, well, you're quenching the spirit. I'm like, okay, I'm quenching the spirit. Okay, so now you're the leader, and I am now not the leader. And I'm quenching the spirit. Yep, and we're leaving. And I thought, yes, go. <laughs> we need to go. In fact, when his wife said, I just have two questions, and if you can answer these, it'll determine whether I want to go or stay. And apparently she had more say in the relationship, and so I didn't answer them because I wanted them to go. <laughs> I didn't want them to stick around. And, and so they left. <clears throat> and, and this is the same guy that was an assistant, and he kept marrying people even though he wasn't a, uh, an ordained minister anymore. See, this is the kind of stuff that goes around and people don't know about. They don't really share all the time. But so many times the Lord wants us to go through the promised land. I want to go through the promised land. A few people here want to go through the Amen. promised land. But we can't go through unless everybody wants to go through. Unless everybody wants to go through. And what happens? They leave. And what happens to them? They wander. Just like the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. For how long? Forty years until he replaced them with people that wanted to go through the promised land. And I'm excited right now because I believe that we have people that want to go through the promised yes. land right now. We've got three new families, another one that wants to join us. They're excited. And, and then the ones that are here, all of you that are here, excited. But if you let the enemy come in, say we can't do it for whatever reason, 
Moses, it's your fault. Caleb, it's your fault. Then you're not getting it because God is bigger than that. Yes, he is. Is it my work? No. No, it's God's work. See, we don't understand this. See, God blesses by favor, not by our righteousness. So my righteousness has nothing to do with it. A pastor's righteousness has nothing to do with it. You think a church is huge because of a pastor's righteousness, and you, you don't understand it. It's huge because God's grace. Amen. That's only it. Nothing to do with him. You, they would ask Chuck all the time, why is it that? He goes, I have no idea. What did you do? I don't know. I just taught God's word, and that's it. It's just grace. It's just grace. And I think the people that start to murmur and complain are the ones that don't want to go into the promised land. And the Holy Spirit knows this. And it gets revealed. And they wander. The angel was to get them there. God has a purpose to get you there. Yes. And to get you through. That's his plan. That is his plan always. For every church today, he wants to get you there and through. Do you want to join along or do you want to not? Because that's up to you. And it's up to the Holy Spirit revealing that truth to you, too, also. So blessings of promise of their obedience, verse 22. If you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. Now, this is the Messianic covenant, so understand this. Under the Messianic covenant, they had to be obedient in order for God to Bless them, okay? That's the law. We're not under that covenant no longer. We get blessed from God's favor. Our sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ you, already. Jesus. Past, present, and future. God's already made us all righteous in his eyes. We're already in the heavenly places. We're already there. We just need to stop judging each other and start getting to where he wants us to be at. In the New Testament, it's God's favor that is given to us by grace, not because of our righteous acts. The only reason that we have righteous acts is because we love him and we want to please him. And that's why we act righteously. In the Old Testament, obey my voice and I'll bless you. I will bless you, I will bless your family. And so that was their requirement. Verse 23 says, the angel will go before you and bring you in to the Amorites, to the Hittites, and to the Parasites, and the Canaanites, and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. That's God's plan. And as I said, they're not going to go in. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he, he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you, no one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. So again, this is God's plan for them as they go into the promised land. But they missed it. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among all the people to whom you, you come. The NIV says, to whom you encounter. So that is all the people from the land of Canaan. And I, and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the fields become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. Again, so you're going to go in there, and you're going to conquer everything. In fact, I've already given it to you, but you're not going to take it really quickly because there's not enough of you to populate. And so you're going to take it little by little. But be careful, that we, and we're going to see this later on. Be careful that once you get in there, you wipe them all out. Don't let any live. Don't let any come into your camp. Otherwise, they corrupt you with their idols, with their idols. He wants them to not worship idols on the Sabbath. And this is where they'll begin to worship idols, and then we see the whole story that happens with Babylon later on when the idols are in the temple of God. Now, again, personal. I, 
think that God takes things little by little. He does it in our lives. He doesn't give us everything right away. Just little steps at a time. You know, you're a young believer. So just read your word. Just relax. Get to know God. Take little steps. Experience it. And then you take bigger steps. And bigger steps. Be faithful while you're doing that. You know, he's not going to give you everything right away. You need to understand that's how God works. And maybe he's working that way in this church, little by little. You know, as we see our church from the beginning, 24 years ago, 25 coming up in, in uh, January, where are we at today compared to then? Well, we own this building. We have cement out there with canopies and a trailer and rent for more children's classrooms, a lot more than what we had then. He's given us more of this land. He's given us more territory. He's beautifying this place. And there's still more that's coming. So it comes in stages. He just doesn't give it to us. Now, you might make the argument, oh, some, some churches do. You know, I, I know a guy right now uh, that has a church in Temecula. He's been out there for, well, longer than me. And they're just now growing. And they bought a piece of property. And they're now building their own church. But it's taken 20-something years to get there. It wasn't right away. And we need to have patience. I think that this trailer was a test. Like to the children of Israel, who's going to stick around? And people look at it. People, see, again, people think two ways. We're not getting the trailer done. That means God's not here. Something's wrong. Or... The enemy doesn't want to get this trailer done. Man, I can't wait to get it done to see what God's going to do. Yes. i rather believe the latter, that God wants to do something, because I believe God wants to do something. Yes, he will. And I think that he wants to build our faith. He wants to build our patience, to wait upon him. He's not going to give us everything right away. He's not going to give you everything right away. Just give him time to work. <clears throat> So don't go in there thinking you're going to conquer the whole land. Just take a little bit of time. Otherwise, the beast will grow and they'll consume you. We don't want that to happen. God knows what he's doing. And I will set your boundaries from the Red Sea to the Sea of Philistri and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand. You shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare for you. God has prepared a work for us to do here. Let's just be patient and wait on him to do that work. <clears throat> We've been waiting a long time to get that submitted. Yes. And we didn't have the resources to do it. And nobody wanted to help. And we had to go outside of the church and plead with somebody, just like we did for the carpet, too. Outside the church to plead for someone to help. And God sends somebody to not just only pay for it all, but to do all the work and laying it and finishing it. And then they decided they're going to come here to the church. And they still want to do all the cement work behind the church. Awesome. Get it all done, cemented in, and looking all clean. That's the Lord. Amen. That's the Lord. Same with the carpet. We were looking for carpet. We were we were pricing it and so forth. And I just threw it out there again, outside the church. <laughs> and I said, look, if anyone has carpet out there, you know, let me know if you know how to lay carpet. And all of a sudden, boom. You know, we've got carpet that's just sitting in, in our place. You know, we don't need it all. You, you can have it. And so we got carpet. <laughs> and then the installer came out to give us a quote. And as we're talking, he says, I'm a Christian too, and I go to Harvest. He says, I want to bless you guys. We'll just install it for free. Wow. You know, that's God. Yes, That is, is God. That's grace, and that's not my righteousness. And God is slowly doing that. So awesome. And since it, hit, it is his work, all we need to do is be faithful disciples of Jesus. Amen. Just stay faithful. Persevere through whatever it is you're going through. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. 
pray the Holy Spirit, Lord, and take your truth and just open up our eyes that our hearts may receive it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for coming.